years ago what this represents. What I mean, the numbers that come on before the snow. What's the storm? Could be from the ground before the snow. What's the storm? You had the most great military people in the snow. I will tell you that. We had a great evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. What storm, Mr. President? You'll find out. Give us a hint on your guesses. Thank you, everybody. Now polling at about 40%. That means 60% of Jewish people are going to vote for a Kamala or a Democrat. And honestly, you ought to have your heads examined. You ought to have your heads examined. And those votes may be necessary for us to win. I say us to win because we're in this together. But who are these people? Who are the 60% that would vote? And I really believe that bad things, very bad things are going to happen. And I'll put it to you very simply and as gently as I can. I wasn't treated properly by the voters who happen to be Jewish. I don't know. Do they know what the hell is happening? If I don't win this election and the Jewish people would really have a lot to do with that if that happens, because at 40 percent, that means 60 percent of the people are voting for the enemy. Israel, in my opinion, will cease to exist within two years. And I believe I'm 100 percent right. You know, there's a hat that comes out. Trump was right about everything. And I believe I'm right. And that's a hell of a thing to say. But I believe I'm right. If I do win, Israel will be safe and secure, and we will stop the toxic poison of anti-Semitism from spreading here. All over America, it's spreading. It's spreading like it's never spread before. I've never seen anything like it. I really believe it would be obliteration, and it'll happen quickly, too. It's very close to happening. With your vote, we will reject anti-Semitism in our schools, reject it in our foreign policy. We will reject it in our immigration system. But all of that starts with rejecting Kamala Harris at the ballot box this election. Number one, she doesn't know what the hell she's doing. She doesn't know. She can't do an interview. How do you think she'll do against President Xi? She can't do an interview. And I'm not even saying she's stupid for not doing that, but her handlers know what they're doing. Can't have it. We went through four years of that. We can't go through another four years of that. Together, we will save the United States of America, and we will save the state of Israel on November 5th, 2024. It will be the most important day in the history of Israel. It will be the most important day in the history of the United States. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. God bless Israel. Thank you. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. Ezekiel chapter 21, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem, and drop your word toward the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and will draw forth my sword out of its sheath, and will cut off from you the righteous and the wicked. Seeing then that I will cut off from you the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of its sheath against all flesh, from the south to the north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath. It shall not return any more. Sigh, therefore, thou son of man, with the breaking of thy loins and with bitterness, sigh before their eyes. And it shall be when they say unto you, Wherefore sighest thou? That thou shalt answer, For the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint, and all knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it cometh, and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 
son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Say, A sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? And contemneth the rod of my son as every tree. And he hath given it to be furbished, that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened, and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. Cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people. It shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. Smite therefore upon thy thigh, because it is a trial. And what if the sword contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord God. Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy, and smite thine hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time, the sword of the slain. It is the sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth into their privy chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that their heart may faint, and their ruins be multiplied. Ah, it is made bright, it is wrapped up for the slaughter. Go thee one way or other, either on the right hand or on the left, whithersoever thy face is set, I will also smite mine hands together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. Hmm. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all comfort, the Father of all mercy, we bow our knees in worship and say hallelujah to your holy and righteous name. We thank you, Lord God, for justifying those of us who have placed all of our faith in you. We are resting in your finished work, King Jesus. We have nothing to offer you except the words of our lips, the praise of our mouths, which is to confess that you are our Lord and Savior, and you have given us a new heart a new heart that is a heart of flesh, and you have sealed it with your Holy Spirit. And so we thank you, King Jesus, for the new birth. We thank you that you've given us the gift of repentance, that you have called us to yourself by taking us by the hand, by literally dragging us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light, because you have ordained before the foundations of the world all the vessels of glory that you had predestinated to be in your hands at the appointed time. And so we thank you, Lord, for the calling and for the choosing. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the forgiveness of sins and giving us everlasting life. We thank you, Lord, for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which has washed us whiter than snow and taken all of our sin as far as the east is from the west. We thank you, Lord, for this new life that we have in you. For you have given us life and life more abundantly. We thank you, Lord, that as we are in you, King Jesus, all things have become new. And because everything has become new, we don't look back because everything behind us is fading away. Our old life is buried with you. Our old life is done. We're living this new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we thank you for the anointing from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. And we pray that you would fill us with the quickening of the seven spirits of God so that we can do as you say, live as you say, talk as you say, think as you say, because we have the mind of Christ and so we lean upon you at all times. We do not lean upon our own understanding, but in all of our ways we acknowledge you and you are going to direct our paths. You've brought us this far, Lord Jesus Christ, and we're just beginning. Mm. The race that you have us in, as we get to the finish line here real soon, on the day when you appear on the clouds, we know that that's the first day of forever. <laughs> it's a narrow road that only a few people find, but the end of the narrow road that only a few people find is everlasting life, which will have no end. And so we thank you for the abundance. We thank you for the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. We thank you for clothing us with the whole armor of God. We thank you, Lord, for sharpening our sword with the word of God. And so as we study to show ourselves approved right now, King Jesus, as we seek you while you may be found and call upon you while you are near, we pray that the engrafted word, which is able to save our soul, will fill us so that we can not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, because we are trusting in you 
King Jesus. May we decrease so that you could increase, Holy Spirit. May we continue to be humble in your sight as we trust you because you, King Jesus, are the only one worth trusting. Oh, Lord, how we love you because you first loved us. And we pray for the peace of Yerushalayim. In the matchless, self-sacrificing name, the name that is above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Señor Jesus. We pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, hallelujah, saints of God. It's so good to be back with another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Opened. Everything will change. And praise King Jesus, you know. <laughs> it's amazing, right? You know, I, I had planned to continue to do the prophesy series <laughs> through Ezekiel. Hallelujah. And I'm going to do it by the grace of God. So help me, God. <laughs> but as I was continuing to study to show myself approved, a workman who needed not be ashamed because God is rightly dividing the word of truth as he opens up my eyes to behold wondrous things out of his word and he teaches me great and mighty things that I do not know. God told me to look at Trump. <laughs> God told me to look at Trump through all the midst of my studies. Amen. And so that's why I brought out those three clips. Amen. These three clips of President Trump. Remember, this first clip was when he was president. Right. He was surrounded by all of the military brass, all the military leaders. And he said that this was the calm before the before the storm that they were looking at. Right. And then the reporters asked, as you heard, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> and President Trump said, hey, you'll find out. <laughs> and right before this brief clip ended, somebody mentioned Iran. Right. <laughs> somebody mentioned his policy against Iran. And so, of course, this dovetails into everything that we are seeing manifest before our very eyes. Hallelujah. Iran is the catalyst, according to what thus saith the Lord, that will bring about the cloudy and dark day. Mm. Iran is the catalyst. That's what God said. <laughs> Iran is the catalyst that will bring about the cloudy and dark day. This is what God said. Let me show it to you because we're going somewhere with this. Amen. We're going somewhere with this because uh, the time is short and the days are evil. Amen. And because we are redeeming the times, knowing that we have but a limited time to do whatever it is that God has told us to do, we're not in the darkness. We are not ignorant. We are in the light as he is the light. And because he has opened up our eyes, and taught us everything that we need to know, even before he does it, we walk in purity of mind and soul and spirit, trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, knowing that nothing can come against us because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 51, my goodness, speaking about the utter destruction of Babylon. God says this about Babylon. Mm. Make bright the arrows, verse 11. What are the arrows? The arrows are the missiles, right? There were no missiles in Jeremiah's day, but uh, we know because we have the Holy Spirit, uh, as he gives us the understanding of the modern application, the arrows are the missiles, amen? So God says, make bright the arrows. Okay, get them all fired up, hallelujah. Get them all fired up, ready to go. Gather the shields. Okay, there's going to be no, uh, <laughs> there's going to be no retaliation. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. So God is the one who's bringing this all about. <laughs> right? God is the one who is the sovereign, who is orchestrating everything according to his perfect plan. And God has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. Okay. <laughs> the modern day Iranians have the ancient spirit of the kings of the Medes, right? That's why they will accomplish everything that God has ordained for them to accomplish. And what does God say the Medes are going to accomplish? For his device is against Babylon to destroy it. God says that it's his device, right? This is his work, right? And his work is against Babylon. And God says his work against Babylon is to destroy it. Okay, 
the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, right? The treacherous dealer that dealeth treacherously because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple, okay? <laughs> right, God says this in verse 12. Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. For the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. God said, except the Lord keep the city. <laughs> except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Right? Okay, this is a mockery of what Babylon is going to try to do on this day. Right? Because Babylon trusts in her military might. Babylon trusts in the good old greenback. Right? Babylon trusts in her witchcrafts, her sorceries. And God says that Babylon has been practicing it since the days of her youth. Okay, going all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Right? At the time of the end, Babylon the Great has united the whole world together under the banner of idolatry. Okay. God says, set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Mm. Get everything ready. God says, in his mockery of Babylon, he says, even if Babylon were to mount up to heaven. Okay. Who was the president that, in, that established the Space Force? Right. Who was the president that established uh, the Space Force in Babylon the Great? <laughs> well, of course, you just saw him. It was none other then President Trump. Look what God says about Babylon's space force. Mm. Look what God says about Babylon's space force. God says this. Mm. God says this, hallelujah. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 51, I'll begin at verse 52. Wherefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will do judgment upon her graven images, and through all her land, the wounded shall groan. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, space force, and though she should fortify the height of her strength, space force, yet from me shall spoilers come unto her, saith the Lord. God says he has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Mm. President Trump, you know, President Trump, he reminds me of Balaam, right? He reminds me of Balaam because we know, according to what he's said out of his own mouth, that he never had to ask God for forgiveness. He doesn't think that he's ever done anything wrong that merits asking God for forgiveness. He says that I, I'm just going to try to do things better, do things right, right? <laughs> he's never confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, right? So we know out of his own lips that he is not a believer in the one that we love because he first loved us. Amen. And so all we could go by is what he has said. And then, of course, we could see the fruit that manifests from his life. But I'm not going to be a fruit inspector about what President Trump has done and is doing in regards to that because you already know. Amen. You see with your own two eyes. Amen. But needless to say, he reminds me of Balaam, right? <laughs> right? He reminds me of Balaam, who was that prophet <laughs> that was wicked, right? But yet God still used him to give prophecies. <laughs> God still used Balaam to give prophecies. And as a matter of fact, God used Balaam to bless Israel when Balaam was hired to curse Israel. Mm. And that leads me to the next video. <laughs> that leads me to the next video. Right. Look what Trump is doing. This was on September 19th, 2024. This was yesterday. This was yesterday. Trump was giving uh, this message at the Israeli American Council. Right. <laughs> it, you know, stirring up his uh, his base. Right. To secure votes. And specifically, he was talking to those who call themselves Jews. <laughs> right. And this was on the front line pages today of how. Trump actually sparked anti-Semitism because, in essence, he was blaming the Jews already if he fails to win the November election. And as you heard in this brief clip, what he was saying, right? What he was saying about the closeness of Israel's destruction. He said, 
when it comes, it's going to happen fast. And he says if he doesn't get elected within two years, Israel is going to be obliterated. But we know what the Bible says. We know that's not going to be right. right? It's a false prophecy. We know that Israel is going to be decimated for sure. right? And that's what we've been going on over this channel and what we're going to continue to see because there's two sieges still to come. Right? There's the siege on the dark and cloudy day, according to Ezekiel chapter 4, when the iniquity of Israel has completed, as Ezekiel is told to lay on his left side for the iniquity of Israel for 390 days. Amen. And so when that is completed, because 390 days that number 390 has the same numerical value of shemen, which is oil. And so God has an exchange program. Amen. God has an exchange program right now. And anybody, whether you're of Israel or you're of the nations, you could become one in Christ Jesus and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, which is the oil. Amen. We trade in all of our iniquity. Amen. And in return, he gives us his perfect righteousness, his justification, right? Because God counts us as righteous, not because of our own work, but because of our faith in God who has forgiven all of our sin, according to Romans chapter four, verse five, right? Right? God has counted us as righteous. My goodness. It's his imputed righteousness that is given to us, right? Not for anything that we have done, no. Right? We're not saved by our own works because all of our work is as filthy rags in his sight. No, we are saved because of our faith in God who forgives us of our sin. Amen. All predicated because of his amazing grace, because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. His name is Jesus Christ. And because all of our faith is placed in him, the great exchange takes place during the church age as Ezekiel demonstrates this, as he lies on his right side for the iniquity of the house of Israel for 390 days. But at the point when the iniquity for Israel is complete, mm, at that very moment, there's going to come a siege, cloudy and dark day. And at that very moment, right before it happens, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, those of us who are found in Christ are going to be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the promise. That's the blessed hope, because the blessing has to come before the curse. But if you get left behind in the stone, okay, this stone that President Trump was prophesying about, right? This storm that President Trump was prophesying about where Iran was coinky dinkily, right? Mentioned at the end of the clip. Right? This storm, the cloudy and dark day where God says he has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Mm. On that day when Iran destroys the great Satan. Oh, yeah. The ten kings. Iran is part of them. On that day when Iran goes after the great Satan. Oh, yeah. And she's coming all for violence, her and many people with her. Okay. On that day, cloudy, dark day, if the storm is here, mm, what's your foundation left behind? Well, when the storm is here, and if you get left behind because your sins were never forgiven, you did not make the great exchange. Well, not only will you be caught up in the whirlwind of the South, as God brings out his sword and he cuts from the south to the north mm, upon all flesh, okay, the righteous and the wicked. What does that mean? What is Ezekiel talking about, the righteous? I thought the righteous are going to be with God. No, those are the self-righteous people, right? Those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Those who talk the talk but never walk the walk, right? Those who the seed came upon the soil of their heart and it fell by the wayside or it fell among thorns or it fell among stony places. <clears throat> when push came to shove, cloudy and dark day, okay? When God opened up the door of his house, 
and he uncovered every skirt and he saw that you was never a sheep. You was just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, no wonder you had built your foundation upon the sand. No wonder you got left behind in the whirlwind of the south. On that day, not only will Iran come all for violence to destroy Babylon the Great, because God says his device is against Babylon to destroy it. But she will also go against Israel. Uh-oh. The apple of his eye, King Jesus. Okay. And God says, he who touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. And on that day, same day, cloudy and dark day, day of the Lord, come like a thief in the night, well worth the day if you're under his feet. Mm. God says he has promised <laughs> yet once more. I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Everything's going to shake. Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog is the first siege. <laughs> okay. That's why God says in the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, that everything that moves upon the ground, all creeping things, all the birds of the heavens, all the fish of the sea, and every man that is on the planet left behind in every wall will fall to the ground. God has a plumb line in his hand. <laughs> okay. God has a plumb line in his hand and you're not with him on the wall. So guess what? Your own wall, your own work, right? Will not be able to stand on that day. God is going to remove the pillars, the body of Christ. Amen. Because we are in him. Amen. We have run to the strong tower and we are safe. Amen. His imputed righteousness has been credited to us and God sees himself inside each and every one of us that have believed on his name. And we are sheltered in the secret place of the Most High, brought into the Father's house in the twinkling of an eye, but everybody under his feet hit the deck. Everybody under his feet hit the deck. Okay. God's coming. Hallelujah. God's coming. Double destruction upon Babylon the Great. Okay. Can't even find it. God says he's going to make it like Sodom and Gomorrah. Where's that at? Okay. <laughs> You've seen the multiple documentaries on YouTube. I've seen it with my own two eyes. And guess what? I ain't seen nothing. Where is it? Okay. Where is Sodom and Gomorrah? Where are the cities of the plain? Where that? Can't even see it. Nothing but a bunch of sofa balls. Okay. God says, like as he did under Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain. God says the same fate is going to come upon Babylon the Great. Where's she at? Mm. At the same time that Iran, the ten kings, okay, many people with them, Iran, Turkey, right? Russia, China, North Korea, many people with them, all coming for violence. They will heap dust and take it when they press the button. Okay, Red Horse, get out the gate. Storm here. Mm. Red Horse, get up. Okay. Pale Horse, get on his behind. Okay. Pale Horse, do your clean up. Oh, he gonna clean up too. No wonder he in the fourth position. He in the cleanup position. Okay. Paros, get on his behind. Go to and fro, Babylon the Great. Leave no one left. No one left. Mm. God says throughout the whole land, the wounded shall grow. Okay. At the same time, cloudy and dark day. We're talking about the storm today, amen? God says at the same time, okay, Ezekiel 39, Ezekiel 39 tells us that this is the day that he has spoken of, right? This is the day that God has spoken of. This is the day that we're talking about, amen? This is the day that God has spoken about. Mm. Ezekiel 39, verse 8, Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Mm. This is the day, cloudy and dark day. Right when it all begins, the day of sudden destruction. 
just like President Trump said. Amen. Okay, just like President Trump said in this interview, he said it's going to come fast. It's going to come quick, fast, and in a hurry. Okay, it's going to come suddenly. God already told us what's going to happen before it happens, so that when it happens, we'll, won't, we who are in him, we won't be around to see it because we're going to be looking at him face to face, King Jesus, because we are the bride of Christ. But the question is, are you the bride of Christ? Mm. At the same time, okay, <laughs> when the pale horse get out the gate, okay, and he, ran, and he rampages through all of Babylon the Great, well, he also going to rampage across the whole world. <laughs> One fourth of all the earth is going to be given over to the pale horse because God has a work to do. He is not going to let the nation of Iran destroy Israel. Okay. That's where President Trump is wrong at. <laughs> President Trump said that the nation of Israel will cease to exist in two years if he's not elected. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, the nation of Israel is going to receive a severe blow. Yes. Okay. The nation of Israel will receive a severe blow. But guess what? It's because King Jesus coming down on the clouds first to get us because the blessing has to come first. Okay. It's because Jesus Christ coming like lightning from east to west and him causing his glorious voice to be heard, the seven thunders. It's because he came like lightning from east to west to get all of us whose sins have been forgiven as far as the east is from the west. It's because of his appearance, his revelation on the clouds as the son of man that the nation of Iran will be rebuked on the cloudy and dark day, right? Gog and Magog and everybody who was with Gog in the land of Magog, Persia, and many people with them. At that very moment that they try to come against the apple of God's eye, God rebukes them and they flee far off. Only one sixth of the army is left. Mm. You see, President Trump is already setting the stage. He's been setting the stage. Right? He had to give out this interview. That's why God didn't take him out mm, a couple weeks ago. Right? It wasn't this time when that bullet whizzed by his head because he had to give this speech right here. Right? He had to give this speech to put the Jews on notice and to put everybody else who has any type of wisdom on notice about how soon all of this is about to manifest just in case you haven't really grasped the picture. Just like he said to the Jews, you don't even know what's going on. Do you know what's about to take place? <laughs> Do you know what's about to take place? It's about to be the cloudy and dark day. The storm is almost here, Jews. Mm. And President Trump, he's already stirring the pot, been stirring the pot. But as you can see, this uproar from this video is saying that he is stirring the pot of anti-Semitism by blaming the Jews if he's not elected. Mm. The whole world will turn against Israel. It's already happening. We see it right before our very eyes. They're already going ballistic again because of what they did that's never been done with those beeper bombs, right? right? People are already calling that unjust, right? They're, people are already calling Israel terrorists when they were just doing what needed to be done because no one has their back except King Jesus and they don't recognize King Jesus yet. So they have to go through this time of trouble. And this is when Ezekiel rose over, mm. right? The first siege is everything we just talked about. That's the first siege that Ezekiel talks about in Ezekiel chapter 4, right? The first siege of Jerusalem. That's the cloudy and dark day. Thou also, son of man, verse 1, <clears throat> excuse me, take thee a tile, right? So the tile is clay, right? That's, that's clay. <laughs> and lay it before you and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it. Okay, so that's the first siege of what we've been talking about, the battle of Gog and Magog, when the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, that day, the day of sudden destruction, right? The day that comes suddenly, that comes instantly, right? The day that if you're not prepared right now, you're going to be caught like a thief in the night when he breaks into your house because the lights are off. Because if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Right? You ain't got no oil in your lamp. Well, guess what? Night, night. God says we have to work the works of God while it is day. 
because the night is coming when no one can work. On this day, the night has come. The bridegroom is here. And if you're not caught up, ready to meet him in the clouds as he appears in the air with a sharp sickle in his hand and a golden crown on his head, riding like lightning from east to west, if you're not ready on that day, well, well worth the day. This is the first siege, the day of the Lord. God says, lay siege against this tile. Build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Set a camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. This is the day when Ezekiel rose over from his right side to his left side. <laughs> when he rose over from his right side to his left side. Okay. Well, when he rose over from his right side to his left side, well, the left side, when he has to lay on his left side for the iniquity of the house of Judah, for 40 days, that's the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm. That's the seven-year tribulation, <laughs> right? That's the day that Jesus Christ said is like no other time in human history. God said there's no time like it before, and there will never be a time like it again. He says in verse 3, moreover. So this is even after the first siege, right? After the first siege, what else has to happen? The second siege, okay? Here comes the Antichrist. Moreover, here comes the hunters. Moreover, here comes Nimrod and Esau. Okay. Here comes Jehazaniah and Pelatiah. Okay. Here comes the one who has feet like a bear. Mm. Body like a leopard. Uh oh. Mouth like a lion. Ooh. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the false prophet. Mm. Moreover, take thou unto you an iron pan. So now God says, take an iron pan. <laughs> right? You see, when you have the whole counsel of God, you know what's happening. Right? You know that this is Daniel. Right? You know that this is Daniel chapter 2. Right? The fourth beast kingdom. Right, the iron mixed with the clay. Remember, the clay is already there. The clay is the tile with Jerusalem on it. This is right here. Right, this is the first siege. Right, the tile with Jerusalem portrayed upon the tile. Right, well, that's the clay. Right, that's the clay. Mm. And the clay is going to be besieged. Right, when everything changes. But that's not all, because God says, moreover. <laughs> right. Moreover, after the first siege, right, after the destruction of Babylon the Great, after uh, the rebuke of Gog and Magog, after uh, the day of sudden destruction, okay, there's still more to come. Ezekiel has to roll over to his left side for 40 days. Uh-oh. And 40 is the number of testing. 40 is the number of trial. Uh-oh. The final test, right? Final test, right, of this age. <laughs> final test of this age that has lasted for 6,000 years. The final test, seven years. Mm. And God says, moreover, take unto you an iron pan. Okay, so here comes the iron, right? And the Bible tells us that the iron is going to try to mix with the clay. Daniel chapter 2. Right? The iron is going to try to mix with the clay. Okay, Why? Because the heavens have shook. Mm. And so who's, the, who's on the earth now? Confined. right? Uh, the dragon and all of his minions. Okay. Mm. Here comes... <laughs> what's his name? What's that guy's name? Okay, the WEF guy. What's his name? Uh, Paul Schwab. Right, him. <laughs> His wet dream. Here, here comes his wet dream. Bill Gates, right? Yavel Harari, the the sodomite. You know what what they talk about, right? Now, 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 this is here. Everything that they talk about, right? You will own nothing and be happy. You will eat the bugs. Okay, all that. <laughs> Agenda twenty thirty. Well, here it is. Here comes the iron pan. Uh oh. Here comes. Ezekiel on his left side for the 40. Ooh, the 40 for the 40. Mm. But guess what? Ain't no more 40s. Mm -mm. Ain't no more hanging out with the homeboys. Oh, no. Okay. 
God says, moreover, take thou unto you an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between you and the city and set your face against it and it shall be besieged and you shall lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Mm. I mean, the whole world, the whole word is just impregnated with so much meaning. It's just all impregnated with so much to draw out. This is what Jesus Christ said. When you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. Okay. That which was spoken by Daniel, the prophet, when you see the iron make its move to Jerusalem, right? When you see the iron make its move towards Jerusalem, my goodness, right? This is at the point of the abomination of desolation with the end of the ministry of the two witnesses. This is what Revelation chapter 11 tells us, right? The iron doesn't make its final move, okay? To besiege Jerusalem until the end of the ministry of the two witnesses, right? This is Revelation chapter 11, right? That's the second siege <laughs> when the iron mixes with the clay. Mm. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Okay, so we know that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Okay, well, look at the details. What does God say? But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot, Forty and two months. Mm. So for the first half of the tribulation, right? For the first half of the tribulation, what does God say? Right? For the first half of the tribulation, right? This is a model, right? Of the tabernacle in the wilderness modeled after the heavenly reality and what the temple in Jerusalem was patterned after as well. Okay. So God says, as we look at the model, rise and measure the temple. Right, well, here goes the temple that they're going to rebuild, right? And measure the altar. Well, here goes the altar, the altar of burnt sacrifice, right? God says to measure it. And what else did he say to measure? He says, measure the altar, the temple, and them that worship therein. Okay, so right here. Everybody that is a Jew is allowed entrance in here, right? To offer up sacrifices. But of course, only the priest could go inside the temple. Right? Only the priest could go inside the mikdash, right? But those who were deemed, right, ritually uh, pure uh, could come into uh, the court, right, where the altar is to offer up uh, their sacrifice unto God. Amen. All right. But the details say that don't measure the outside of it, right? Don't measure outside of here, right? Don't measure the outside because God says it's been given unto the Gentiles. Right, so the, for the first 42 months, the Gentiles, they're not going to tread inside here. Right? The Gentiles are not going to tread inside here right? because the Jews are deceived for the first 42 months. They think everything is A-OK. -okay. They got the temple. Right? The temple of the Lord is here. The temple of the Lord is here. Right? They think that everything is hunky-dory. Right? They made a covenant with death, and they don't even know it. Mm. And so they think that everything is going as it should be according to the law of Moses. Right. The uh, uh, the Gentiles are not trampling inside uh, the court. Right. You can't come inside here unless you're a Jew. Mm. Right. And so they're offering up their sacrifices and they're thinking that they have fellowship with the most high God. But little do they know, well, the iron is on his way. Mm. The iron is on its way. OK, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Right. But for the first 42 months. Amen. For the first 42 months, the Gentiles are trampling all outside of the court, right? They're all outside of here doing what they do during the first 42 months. And guess what? The two witnesses are right here, right? The two witnesses are right here, right? Preaching to everybody outside and also preaching to everybody who's coming inside, right? They're giving a message to the Jews and they're giving a message to the Gentiles. They're right here, right? Because they're preaching in Jerusalem, right? And uh, they're stationed, right, by the temple, I believe. But they're not inside, right, because they have a message not only for the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, just like the type and shadow shows us. Ezekiel was told, as a type and shadow of one of the two witnesses, that he has to preach to the house of Israel. 
Whereas John, who was another type of the two witnesses, is told that he has to preach to the nations, right, to the Gentiles. And so they are stationed right here, right? And they are preaching to those who are coming to worship, okay? The Jews, as well as all those who are deceived by uh, the rule of the Antichrist during the first 42 months, amen? Because the Antichrist, you know, he hasn't made his move yet. It's not until the midpoint that he makes his move, mm, right? It's not until the midpoint that he makes his move. This is what we see in Revelation chapter 11. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Right. So for the thousand two hundred and sixty days is synonymous with the forty two months. Right. It's synonymous with verse two. Verse two and three are synonymous. Amen. Because there's going to come a change at the midpoint. Amen. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished, hallelujah, their testimony. Amen. Okay. When it comes to the 1260th day, Mm, well, here comes the iron. Okay, this is what Ezekiel's talking about. Okay, here comes the iron. <laughs> Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan. Well, here he comes. Mm. Here comes Daniel chapter two, the iron and the miry clay. Oh, the final move. Okay, the final move of that old crooked serpent. The final move. Okay, his last little slither. Ooh, his last little slither. Mm. Okay, his last little sliver. Who was last little sliver? Here he comes. Okay, well, we know. Okay, because he a rattlesnake. He got one rattle left too. Okay, he got one last sliver. We're talking about the last sliver, and then he got one little rattle left. A thousand years later, he got a little rattle. Okay, he got one last sliver. We got one last sliver. Okay, his last sliver, midpoint. Last liver, midpoint, night, night. Okay. The last, oh, I'm talking about the last rattle. A thousand years later, here he come again. One last rattle. <laughs> right. Oh, one last rattle at the end of the kingdom. A thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And here he come out the bottomless pit. You want to rattle one more time. You want to rattle one more time, you little dragon. You will not quit. Okay. Got to get that last rattle in. Ooh, but guess what? God going to get the last word, amen. You may get the last rattle. Ooh, it's going to be the last rattle. You know that. <laughs> but God has the final word. Lake of fire. Make it hot. Mm. Lake of fire. Make it hot, old dragon. And get down there at the bottom. And keep on falling forever. Amen. Can't wait. <laughs> Can't wait for God to speak the last word to all the wicked. Amen. Can't wait. Hallelujah. Because we know that iniquity will not rise up a second time. Amen. We know that affliction will not arise a second time. Amen. <laughs> and we know that everything that God does lasts forever. Amen. That's it. Ooh, that's how. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so we see the final little slither right here. Amen. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the two witnesses, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Mm. So, of course, we know that's Jerusalem. Amen. That's Jerusalem. And so we even know <laughs> that they're not going to be slain, right, inside the temple precincts, right? Just as Jesus wasn't slain inside uh, the temple precincts, but he was slain outside the city, amen? He was uh, slain outside the camp, amen? And so that's why I believe in these details we can see that the two witnesses are not going to be inside uh, where uh, the Jews are offering up their sacrifices for the 42 months, but they're going to be at the gates. Okay. They're going to be at the gates. Okay. 
preaching to those coming in and to those who are trampling all around for the first 42 months. But then when the iron appears, right, when the Antichrist makes his last little slither, right, when he has his magic show, he gets the deadly head wound. And when he gets the deadly head wound, right, he overcomes the two witnesses and the two witnesses are killed and they're going to be outside of the temple precincts, right? But the temple precincts are in Jerusalem. So they're going to be in Jerusalem and they're going to be killed just as uh, our Lord Jesus Christ was killed. I'm not saying they're going to be crucified, but who knows what type of death they're going to have. But needless to say, they're only going to be asleep for three and a half days. right? And the whole world are going to look on their dead bodies for those three and a half days, and they're going to be rejoicing, having their orgies, right? Uh, sending gifts, making merry. Okay. <laughs> but God has the ultimate table flipper. Mm. Right? God has the ultimate table flipper. Amen. <laughs> Three and a half days later, ooh, he turned the tables. Amen. <laughs> hey, Mr. DJ. <laughs> Play that song, Mr. DJ. Amen. We're going to turn them tables. Amen. He's going to turn them tables. He's going to be on the ones and twos. We're going to get on them ones and twos. Amen. We'll get on them ones and twos now. Amen. He gonna get on the ones and twos. King Jesus, hallelujah. Amen. He gonna, he got a grand finale. Amen. Because when the two witnesses are caught up in the clouds, amen. Uh, there's only forty two months left. Amen. <clears throat> only forty two months left for the iron to do what the iron's gonna do, and the iron, you know what he gonna do? He gonna make it hot, but not the kind of hot that Jesus is going to make it hot for him, okay? But it's going to be hot, okay? Because it's night, night, go. Okay, final 42 months, none but darkness. Can you imagine the terror? Okay. Here we go inside. Of, he's inside of here now. <laughs> okay, here goes a dragon, and he's inside of here. Mm. The dragon is inside of here, and he done took the mask off. Ooh-wee. Final 42 months, iron mixing with the clay, mask off. Can you imagine the terror? Mask off. Final 42 months, dragon. Can you imagine the terror? Okay. That's why I played this last clip of Donald Trump, right? It's been made into all these different memes. It just, all these different memes of what he said, right? But he is like Balaam to me, right? He said that uh, they're eating the cats, right? They're eating the dogs. They're eating the pets, right? <laughs> I saw some funny videos about that, but needless to say, he's prophesying. Mm. He's prophesying what's to come, okay? Okay, but God makes it even more succinct. He says during that time, let everyone eat the flesh of one another. Cannibalism. Mm. Okay. Everyone eat the flesh of one another. Cannibalism. Okay. Because there ain't no more food, right? There's no food during the 40 for the 40, right? The black horse got out the gate right away, right? With the first siege, the black horse got out the gate, mm. right? When Babylon the Great was destroyed, right? When Gog and Magog was rebuked, right? When Damascus ceased from being a city, right? That day, when God took out his sword and he cut from the south to the north, when one-fourth of all the earth died, that day, Black Horse, he got out the game. Get out that game. Okay. Famine! Seven years. Okay. <laughs> and for seven years, God says, Everyone eat the flesh of one another. Mm. Right? President Trump prophesying they're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the pets. Okay. <laughs> President Trump prophesying. Okay. He prophesying of what's to come. Mm. Ezekiel prophesied of what's to come. Right? Ezekiel prophesied with 100% accuracy because this is the word of the Lord. God says in verse 4, Lie thou also upon uh, thy right side, and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. 
I have appointed each day for a year. Therefore you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and you shall not turn from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. Here he goes, the defiled bread. Mm. Take thou also unto you wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches, and put them in one vessel. And make thee bread thereof, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. Look what he's saying. Amen. Okay, during the three hundred and ninety days, Ezekiel is allowed to eat and drink, right? Because there's still food. <laughs> right? There's still food during the three hundred and ninety days. But yet, during the three hundred and ninety days, he's prophesying of what's going to happen when he rolls over for the forty days. Okay. Because when he rolls over for the 40 days, the 40 days is a time of Jacob's trouble. There is no food. Mm. They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the pets. Mm. Verse 16, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment, that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. Okay. This famine is far reaching, though, right? Because Amos gets down to where the rubber meets the road. Amos gets down to the nitty gritty about this famine <laughs> because God says through the prophet Amos that it's not just going to be a famine of bread and it's going to be a famine of bread. Oh, yeah. God says through the prophet Amos, it's not just going to be a famine of water. And there will be a famine of water. Oh, yeah. But God said that this famine that Amos got down to the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road. He said that this famine during the cloudy and dark day. Is a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Mm. And God says that the people who are left behind in the 44 to 40, they're going to be searching from the north to the east. Mm. They're going to be going from sea to sea, mm. looking for the word of the Lord. And guess what? They will not find it. Mm. Right? Church is gone. Amen. The only ones who aren't wicked, right, when it all begins during the cloudy and dark day that are on the earth are the two witnesses, right? Out of the billions that are left that are getting up from the dust, right? The only two that have the light, right, that have the oil are the two witnesses out of billions of people left behind, right? Injured, mourning, knees weak, right? Heart melting, right? Arms shaky, right? Every spirit faint, mm, right? And now here comes the deceiver of all deceivers with a mask on. Mm. We got the henchmen, right? That's just like him, the false prophet, Jehazaniah. Mm. Right? And here they both come with the final solution. 666, better take it. Give me your hand. 666, want to buy and sell? What you doing? We had the test run not too long ago. Remember that? Says the false prophet. Mm. We had the test run, did a little experiment. Mm. Did a little experimentation. Had to do a little test run uh, for the final shindig. And guess what? It's the final shindig, says the false prophet. So now, if you want to buy and sell, no more put on your M-A-R-K. Uh-uh. Okay, just a little test run now. Little goat. Better roll up your sleeve. Okay, let me see that hand. You better take this M A R K. Want buy and sell? Okay, want buy and sell? Okay. Mmm. Cloudy, dark day. Whoa, worth the day. Can you imagine the terror? They're eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the pets. Okay. 
But you know what? You better get that 666. You won't eat them dogs. You won't eat them cats. You won't eat them pets. You shall eat the bugs. Ooh. And you know what? You ain't going to own nothing. And you better not complain. Because you know you're going to be happy. Happy with your peppy. That old dragon. Mm. You wanted a world without God. And so guess what? Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> All the day long, he cried out to you for 390 days, right? Eternally symbolized by what the prophet Ezekiel did in his day. And God had an exchange program where you could exchange all of your iniquity during that time. Because God was doing a new thing, calling out anybody from Israel, all the nations to come unto him. Right? Look upon the one who was lifted up on the cross. Place all of your sin upon him. And in return, if you believe in what he accomplished on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, if you believe the gospel, the greatest exchange in all of human history will occur. He will give you the oil. Your 390 for his 390. Ooh, wee. Thank you, Jesus. Your 390 for his 390. My goodness, what an exchange. And all day long and all night long, he called out to you, come, make the exchange. And every time you heard the cry, you said no. So now the table's done turned. It's the 40 for the 40. Mm. 40 for the 40, you left behind, cloudy and dark day. And now you crying. Look at you crying. Now you crying. All them tables done turned. Now you crying. Mm -hmm. They call you Mr. and Mrs. Cry, baby. Now you crying. Mm. Now you crying. Wailing in all streets and crying in all the highways. Alas. Alas. Now you crying. Oh, look at you. Mr. and Mrs. Cry, baby. Look at you. Mm. Them tables turned quick, too, didn't they? Cloudy, dark day. And guess what? The Bible says, God will not hear. Uh -uh. God says, silence! Half hour. Mm. Half hour silence in heaven. Shh, be quiet. Okay. Mm. Half hour silence! Shh, be quiet. A lot of singing and dancing going on up here. Amen. <laughs> Don't want to disturb the party. Amen. Mm. Can't wait for the party. Amen. <laughs> God is good. And this is another thing, and I'll be done. Amen. I'll be done. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing. I've been doing a lot of reflection. You know, because this is what wisdom is, right? This is what wisdom is. Wisdom is learning from other people, right? By observing how they acted and how they behaved and the consequences or the rewards that came to them because of their behavior. And then applying that knowledge and that understanding to your own life so that you could walk in wisdom by either emulating that person or not emulating that person. So I've been doing a lot of reflecting because there were two extreme examples that came out this week, right? One on the side of faith and one on the side of darkness, right? First for the side of faith. And I recommend that you listen to this because this is beautiful. Right? This is beautiful. In my reflecting, I came across him. Stephen Lawson, Number Your Days. Mm. Right. If you don't know, I'm pretty sure you do know. Right. There's this big old scandal where he had to step down from uh, his church in Dallas, Texas, because of some relationship. I don't know. And I had seen him a couple of times, not too familiar with his teachings, to be frank. But when I heard about this, I think it was just yesterday. Right. It was uh, it popped up on my feed. And so I took a listen to it and found out what the spiel was. I had to look him up just to, you know, see uh, why he was so, you know, respected and revered in Christendom. And I came across this um, 
this teaching right here, and he just gave it recently at uh, John MacArthur's church, Number Your Days, two months ago. And this sermon, I mean, it just, it just shook me to my core. Because this is a powerful sermon. Amen. But I said that to say this. You, you see, I saw a lot of comments of people tearing them down and, you know, throwing stones and, you know, mocking and jeering and clapping. And, you know, and it just it just hurt me to my heart because where's the grace? Yeah. What he did was what he did. And that's between him and God. But it's no time to rejoice over a fellow brother or sister who is exposed for the whole world to see and to gloat over their downfall. Yeah, okay, he's disqualified from the ministry because he's not above reproach. I get all that. <clears throat> but what I don't get is all the gloating from people who say that they're Christians, right? And the tearing down and just casting him aside and saying that, Nothing that he'd ever done has amounted to anything for the body of Christ to edify us. And I wholeheartedly disagree because I was extremely edified with this sermon that I listened to. Number your days, Stephen J. Law. This was the only sermon I've listened to so far. I'm going to listen to some more. Right. You see, because where's the grace? Where's the restoration? Right. Not condoning what he did, but where's the grace for him? OK, this is what wisdom is all about. You see, we learn these lessons. Right. God says to take heed. Right. If we think that we stand, take heed lest we fall. Right. We have to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And I had to examine myself. That's why I've been doing a lot of reflecting, because on the other side, of course, it was the P. Diddy thing. Right. Sean Combs, Puff Daddy. Right. The Bible tells it like this. Right. The Bible tells it like this. Mm. Right. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. So on both ends of the spectrum, God pulled down the covers in Christendom with Stephen J. Lawson and in a worldly figure with Puff Daddy. You know, God exposed their sins beforehand for the whole world to see. Right? And so as we take heed to the exposing we don't gloat right same thing with puff daddy i'm not gloating or, or or rejoicing because of everything that he's going through as a matter of fact i see it as an opportunity right i see it as an opportunity for god to put him on time out because everything is going according to god's plan he doesn't live the high life right he doesn't been in the penthouse the private jets he doesn't did everything there is to do under the sun because he had all that money but now god it's putting him in the outhouse right? in order to get his attention because he done said a lot of things. Right? I mean, he, he done said that he believes that God is a woman, right? He got this big old tattoo of a voodoo uh, priestess, right? Which is a demon on his back, right? And, you know, on and on and on down the list, we could talk about P. Diddy, right? But I see this as God's grace because God could take any one of us out at any time when our number's called. Right. Number your days, Stephen J. Lawson. Listen to this sermon. OK, but God didn't take P. Diddy out right? because it's not his time yet. As a matter of fact, because of God's grace, God is giving P. Diddy a chance right, to set him down. Might be the final chance. Who knows? Because there ain't too much time left regardless. He's given him a chance because God loves us all. Right? There's nothing that we can do to stop God from loving us because God so loved the world. Right. Even though when we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. The same love that he had for me and for you and for Stephen Lawson is the same love that he has for P. Diddy. God is no respecter of persons. The same grace that I received, the same grace that you received, the same grace that Stephen Lawson received is the same grace that P. Diddy can receive. Mm. And so I look at it as an opportunity. Amen. I look at it as an opportunity, right, to finally, as he's put on the sidelines, away from all the comforts and all the luxuries that he has always grown used to, to finally recognize that this is it. Mm. The money ain't going to save you. Right? It's only Christ who saves, and I pray not only for him, but for his victims as well as 
Stephen Lawson's victims and whatever that situation is, that the restoration, the reconciliation that the blood of Jesus gives will be appropriated to their lives so that they can know the surpassing riches of Christ. Mm. God's riches at Christ's expense because it's all about Jesus Christ. Mm. And so it just makes you reflect, right? To see these things manifest before your eyes, right? And to take heed and to take stock of your own life, right? Because <laughs> with this whole P. Diddy thing, you know, <laughs> yeah, he all, you know, the thousand bottles of baby oil, right? <laughs> thousand bottles of baby oil, whatever. Well, I was just thinking in my head, well, now he has to be acquainted with the oil of gladness. Amen. Now is his time to be acquainted with the oil of joy. Now, now is his time to be anointed with the oil that overflows. Now is his time to store up the oil in his vessel by believing the gospel as he repents. And God has given him this opportunity as he sits him down because there's no one that God cannot save as long as we have the breath of life. No one is too far gone to receive God's riches at Christ's expense, right? No one. As long as we have the breath of life, we could come to him and we can believe. Amen. And as I was reflecting, you know, I was reflecting on my own life, right? And my own thoughts, right? Because it's all about the thoughts. Amen. It's all about the thoughts because that's how it all begins. It began with a thought in Satan's heart. Translated to the first humans, it began with a thought in Eve's heart, right? She desired the tree. She saw that it was good to make one wise. She started to think, right? She started to think because as a person thinks in their heart, so is that person. So it begins with the thoughts. And I was thinking, man, I'd be having freak offs in my mind, hmm. right? I'd be having freak offs in my mind. My goodness, help me, King Jesus. This is what I was reflecting on. Oh, wretched man that I am. I'll be having freaks off, freak offs of all different types of licentiousness and debauchery and thievery and drunkenness and orgies and uh, lying and cheating and stealing and murder and hate and all types of evil in my thoughts. You talk about a freak off. Come on. I was reflecting, child of God, right? because when them fiery darts come and I don't have the helmet of salvation armored up, and I don't, t by not taking that thought captive, well, here comes my flesh, doing what the flesh does. My goodness, help me, King Jesus. If I don't take that thought captive, let's be real now, child of God, come on. If I don't take that thought captive right then, right now, you talk about a freak off, come on. Have mercy upon me, Jesus. It's a freak off, man. It's a freak off. OK. If I don't take that thought captive, I'm talking about captive to the obedience of Christ right then when that fiery dart comes. Right. I'm walking in the spirit. Amen. <laughs> I'm walking in the spirit, minding my business, eyes focused on King Jesus. Here comes a fiery dart. And if I don't take that thought captive right then and there, it's a freak off. Hmm. Come on, child of God. Amen. It's the thought, right? It's the thought. My goodness. Right? It's the, the very thought that I hate. Mm. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. Mm. The very thought of foolishness, God says, is sin. Talk about a freak off. Come on. I was reflecting, child of God. Mm. I was examining myself to see if I'm in the faith. <laughs> my goodness. Man, I'm not going to be throwing no stones in no glass house because my thoughts, right? My thoughts, as I was reflecting, right, are not pure 100% of the time. Amen. My thoughts are not pure 100% of the time. Amen. My thoughts are not pure. 100% of the time, they're not. Mm. And the reason why they're not is because I'm not armored up. Mm. 
as I was reflecting, I reflected on all the times. And not all the times, because if I was reflecting on all the times, God have mercy. But every time my thoughts was dominated by the flesh because there's no good thing in me, right? There's nothing good in my flesh, right? It's the flesh that kills. It's the spirit that gives life. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So if I'm thinking according to my flesh when the fiery dart comes, not taking it captive through the obedience of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, by thinking on him, calling on him, well, it's a free call. And so I was reflecting and asking Jesus, pleading with Jesus to continue to mold me and shape me into the image of you and keep my thought life pure, keep my thoughts stayed on you because I don't even want to think this type of stuff. Right? I don't want to think any evil. I don't even want to think it. Okay? You see? I don't even want to think it. Right? This is how I know that I belong to him. Right? This is how I know that I belong to him. When I don't even want to think about these type of things. Right? Whereas when I was in the world, who cares? Right? When I was in the world, yeah, it was a freak off like P. Diddy. Okay? Just like all of us when we was in the world. Whatever type of freak off we was in the freak off with. Right, because not only did it was not only was it our thoughts, but it was also our actions in the world. Right, right. We manifested the thoughts, right, because we had no self control. <laughs> right, we we didn't have the Holy Spirit. Right, the fruit of the Spirit. Right, one of the fruit of the Spirit is the last one is self control. Amen. And so, because the Holy Spirit is now in us, Amen. The fruit of self control stops us as we lean upon Jesus Christ from carrying out those thoughts that we may have, mm. right? It's, it's, it's the fruit of self-control that stops us from acting on those thoughts. But to nip it all in the bud, we don't even want to have the thoughts. That's self-control, amen, right? Because our minds are focused on him. And so for my brother here, our brother here, Stephen Lawson, no matter how old you are, right? No matter how old you are, right? He's up there. I don't know how old he is, but, right? It doesn't matter how old you are, right? Sin, right, ravages, right, from conception until death, okay? Sin ravages, right? We were shaped in iniquity, right? We were born in iniquity. We were sinners by choice, sinners by practice. God have mercy on a sinner like me. And praise God that, because of his finished work and our rest in what he's accomplished. Mm. God has counted us as righteous, not because of our work, hallelujah, but because of our faith in him, King Jesus, God manifested in the flesh who forgives us of all of our sin. Our faith is credited to us as righteousness, right? Because we're not trusting in what we can do, no. We're trusting in everything that Christ has already done. And that's why we call upon him to help us, right? That's why we call upon him to control our minds, right? That's why we call upon him to rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. That's why we call upon him to take every thought captive, right? Because we're not trusting in our philosophies, our wisdom, right? Our knowledge. We're calling upon the Holy Spirit to help us to walk circumspectly because the days are evil, right? We're, we're calling upon the Holy Spirit to apply these lessons from other people's lives as we see what they have gone through so that we will not repeat the same mistakes that they did. And so we reflect in our inner man and ask the Holy Spirit to build him up so that even as the outer person is perishing, we know that the incorruptible seed has a far more weightier glory that is ready to be revealed at the time when he appears on the clouds and we can never lose what has been given to us freely by God mm. because of his amazing grace. No one can lose their salvation if we're in Christ, right? Mm. No one can lose their salvation if 
uh, Christ is in them and they are in Christ. Fruit bearing may stop, right? And then God calls home uh, the branch, mm. right? But that branch will never be cast into the fire because that branch was always in him. Amen. As long as the branch is in Jesus. Amen. As long as the branch is in Jesus. Amen. Because that branch is in Jesus, that branch can never be cast into the fire. Amen. The problem comes when the branch is not in Jesus. <laughs> because when the branch is not in Jesus, well, that means that that branch is cast forth and withered. Right? That's John uh, chapter 15, right? John chapter 15, then I'll be done. Amen. John chapter 15, then I'll be done. Look what God says about the branches, amen? But the question is, what type of branch are you? <laughs> are you in Christ or are you not in Christ? John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, right? So if you're a branch in Christ, right? Look at, look at the details. Every branch in me. So first you have to be in him, right? If you're in him, that means that he's in you. You're connected. You have fellowship. But guess what? God wants fruit. And so every branch in him that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So he's going to call you home. He's going to call you home. You're not bearing no fruit. You're right. You're like Ananias and Sapphira. You're like the person that Paul wrote about, right, that was having relations with his father's mother. God said the judgment was to hand him over to Satan, that the flesh is destroyed, but the spirit will be saved, amen? Because the branch was in Christ. It just wasn't bearing any fruit. So God takes it away, calls you home, right? Your time is up. Mm. But guess what? Every branch that beareth fruit, right? Same type of branch, the branch is in him, right? But this branch is bearing fruit. What does he do? Well, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit, right? So we are still walking on his planet by his grace and we want to bear more fruit. And so God purges us as we take lessons from what thus saith the Lord and as we see other people live their lives so that we don't make the same mistakes that they may have made, right? As we examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, as we uh, take heed, uh, lest we also fall, right? Because we want to bear more fruit, right? And so God purges us, right? So that we can be more like him, so that we can realize that it's not in us, it's all of him. Right? We're not relying on our own works. We're trusting in the finished work. And so we're calling upon him at all times, asking him to take every thought captive, knowing that I can't do it. And so I need help every second. I need help, King Jesus. I need help because I don't even want to think these type of thoughts that come when these fiery darts are shot. And I'm not even focused on foolishness. But the devil, he's relentless. The enemy, he's relentless. He's like a roaring lion, right? Seeking whom he may devour. And he continues to come day after day, throwing them darts. But praise be to God that we're being equipped to see when the darts are fired, we're going to have the shield of faith up. We're going to have the helmet of salvation on, right? Because we're calling upon Jesus to help us. We have the sword of the spirit, right? We're calling in all prayer and supplication, help me, Jesus. I don't want to think this, right? Take this thought captive, amen? Take a thought, take this thought captive to your obedience, King Jesus, because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. I don't even want to think these type of thoughts. I don't want to think about robbing and stealing and cheating and gossiping. Right? I don't want to think about murder and deceit. I don't want to think about adultery and fornication. I don't want to think about foolishness. I don't want to think about blasphemy. I don't want to think about anything that's unclean. I don't want to think about anything that's impure. I don't want to think anything that does not bring glory to your name. I don't even want to think it. I don't want to think foolishness. Mm. Because the thought of foolishness is sin. Right? This is growth, child of God. He's purging us so that we can bear more fruit. Right? Because it has to be done by him. He's the one who gives us the self-control. And we see the way that we're walking in the spirit and we want to walk more in the spirit day after day because we're living in the spirit. Amen. 
God says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in the vine. Mm. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Here it goes, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, mm. right? So here goes a branch that's not even abiding in Jesus, right? Here goes somebody who's not even abiding in Jesus, okay? Right? Here goes somebody that has no relationship with Jesus. Well, what happens to this person? If somebody is not in Jesus, abiding in him, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. All right? So this is a totally different type of person. Right? This is a totally different type of person than uh, this branch that is in him that does not bear fruit. Right? Verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. This is somebody who is saved because you can never lose your salvation, but you're not bearing fruit, so God brings you home, right? The flesh is destroyed that the spirit will be saved, mm. right? This branch was connected, right? It was born again, right? It tasted of the root and the fatness. The Holy Spirit was in them, right? The Holy Spirit was in her, amen? But they brought no fruit to maturity, right? They never did anything through the power of the Holy Spirit, and all they did was live according to the flesh, right? But they believed on the finished work of Jesus Christ and received the incorruptible seed, and so therefore they were saved. And so God takes them home, body destroyed, so that the soul, the spirit, will be saved. Whereas somebody that was never in him, right? Somebody who never abided in him, verse 6, well, this person is cast forth as a branch. He's cast forth. <laughs> as a branch. And when this person is cast forth as a branch, this branch is withered. Okay. It's shriveled up. Okay. You can't even tell it's a branch. Okay. It's twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Right. And then men gather this twice dead branch plucked up by the roots that's withered. These people gather them up. Right. And cast them all into the fire and they are burned. This is somebody who's lost. Hmm. This is somebody who never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. Somebody who is a vessel of dishonor. <laughs> right. Somebody who's a goat forever. Amen. And so. Hallelujah. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm praying that, uh, you know, I spoke to somebody's heart because I was speaking to myself, you know, because in everything that we do say and think, we want to glorify God. And as I continue to reflect on these different examples and of course meditating on the word of god i call upon him to search me and to see if there's anything uh, unclean right every day right and he's been talking to me about my thoughts right because i don't want thoughts to manifest into action mm. i don't want thoughts to manifest into action no right but even that is not satisfactory because i don't even want the thoughts right because it's the thoughts that sin, right? Forget the action. We already know the action, okay? The action is sin, okay? But the thought is no better, right? Just the very thought is no better, right? The thought is no better, okay? The thought might as well be the action, and that's what I hate, okay? I just hate the very thoughts that come to my mind, and I'm not even going out of my way to think about foolishness. That's the, that, that's the conundrum. <laughs> I'm not even going out of my way, right? When sometimes these thoughts come, I'm not even going out of my way uh, to think on foolishness. And here comes foolishness. God have mercy. Okay. It don't make no sense sometimes, <laughs> but it's a fight. Amen. <laughs> and I'm in the army of the Lord. Amen. I serve the captain, right? Of the Lord of hosts, right? I serve the captain of the army of the Lord of hosts. I serve the king of kings. I'm a soldier, buck private. Amen. I'm a buck private. Amen. I'm a doorkeeper in the army of the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm a doorkeeper. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Buck private. A tent hut. James Smith. A tent hut. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. This means war. Amen. <laughs> this means war. Hallelujah. 
And I'm fighting the good fight of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm asking you for your prayers, family of God. Gird me up with your prayers. Lift me up before the Father. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that he lifts you up and that he would continue to sanctify us with his truth because his word is truth. And that's why we have to come together like we do, right, through technology to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, right, with the word of God through prayer and supplications, lifting each other up before the Father, asking him for this hedge of protection that he sets around us and to purify us even as he is pure and so that our minds will be stayed on him so that the thought of foolishness won't even have any effect because we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ as we grow together in him, together as one forever, because we're in this together forever. I love you, family of God. I pray that you are blessed. In Jesus' name, praying for the peace of Yerushalayim. I pray and ask it all. Amen.